Hello everyone, today we talk about the Duchy of Croatia, a medieval European state existing roughly from the 7th century to um, the traditional date that would eventually see the transition in the Kingdom of Croatia is 925, as we will see at the end of the video, and we will make a video about the Kingdom of Croatia, as a matter of fact. And uh, first of all, I'm very glad to talk about it because I think we never address Croatia specific in any sp dedicated video um, specifically. And uh, especially this early medieval context is really worth uh, attention for many reasons. The duchy was established essentially in, in the territory of the former Roman province of Dalmatia during the, the migration era. Uh, in fact, in the north uh, westernmost border of uh, of the same empire at the time but as we all see essentially escaping its orbit or at least you know um, being still shared under the one of eventually the revived uh, western empire in Carolingian times and so the history of the duchy is in many ways the history of the autonomization of the Croats uh, from the surrounding peoples also the Bulgarian empire uh, as we will see there were important connections as you can understand with uh, with Venice, with with Serbia, and so we'll hopefully also deal with all these uh, contexts in greater detail than we have done so far. And as you understand, the early medieval reality was pretty fragmented, right? We talk about the duchy uh, and later also of the regnum in kind of a general term. Right? Regnum doesn't mean there was literally uh, a rex or at least a single rex, a bit the, the, the duchy was the same, there were different duchess, uh, which is a, a name that already hints that there were actually counties as well within, right, the duchy was considered the, this kind of arche, um, you know, the, this hegemonic rule that was exercised by single lords that had their centers mostly in the, the most important centers were the, the, the towns of Klis, Solin, Knin, Biazzi, and Nin. Uh, and the duchy comprised territorially the, um, the so-called littoral, so the historical name for the region of Croatia comprising mostly the coastal areas between traditional Dalmatia to the south, the mountainous Croatia to the north, Istria, and the Kvarner Gulf. Um, uh, Istria was an exception because it was mm, under different degree of control under the, the Longobards at the point, the Byzantines, um, and it was at least, however, always contended from the Slav, uh, with, with the Slavs, and we will see also. In fact, there were other entities around who were at some point even conflictful with the same Croatia. Think about the Narentines, this um, pagan state, Pagani, as it was known, in fact, in the Byzantine Empire, because they, they took a long time to Christianize the Lone Piracy, right? So um, we're talking about amphibious realities in many ways. Yes, Croatia took eventually historically like more a continental character, also because Venice came to dominate the coasts um, and led the major urban development along them. But at this point, uh, the Slavic piracy was a thing. Uh, it's kind of overlooked here. Uh, we will talk also about some, say, process of development of the creation of maritime capability, but that kind of always existed. Like the Slavs, while you know, um, overflowing in the in the Balkans, they they at some point reached the sea, even took ships to to reach Africa at some point. This is kind of overlooked, and we'll hopefully talk more in depth um, about the Slavic migration. Uh, and in fact, the same origins of the Croats, as you know, is somewhat debated and or lost at least in in legion. They're not dram overly dramatically. Uh, documented realities, but we kind of have an idea, however, more or less of how it happened, um, as we will see now. So um, the Carolingians and the Byzantines competed for rule over the area. Also, Venice, emerging from the 9th century, came to be a major um, opponent, competitor of Croatia. And the Croatians also fought with the Bulgarians, at some point also, in fact, successfully, uh, and participated in the broader effort uh, of the Carolingian and, and, and Byzantine powers uh, to stem the Arab advance at some point threatened to capture even the areas of, uh, for example, Ragusa, etc. The Slavs uh, also went to fight in Italy for the Carolingians. Um, things like this we will see now. And uh, they 
uh, sought in general to expand their control over the, the important coastal cities that at the time were mostly under the rule of Constantinople, in spite of some, of course, degree of uh, autonomization, which in fact the Croats took uh, advantage of. And in practice, Croatia was, was not a major power, so it was formally uh, vassal of the Franks and the Byzantines, but also de facto independent, especially um, uh, especially after the disgregation of the Carolingian Empire that, as we will see, in fact, the Croatians took a greatly advantage of. And when, in fact, the Duke Branimir was recognized as an independent ruler by Pope John VIII, Right, the Croatians are important in this sense because, in spite of the obvious Byzantine influence, actually they fell directly into the um, into the Catholic um, sphere of influence, the Roman Catholic sphere of influence, as opposed, I don't know, to the Serbians that were more more evidently like involved in the, in the Orthodox dominated area. Um, and there are also a couple of dynasties, as we'll see now, that the, that are respect the Tripimirovic and the Dom uh, Domagojevic that, however, are, in fact, relatively documented, especially in, in the succession of the, the familiar ties, say, between the various dukes, and that they probably kind of were all married into each other by, by some, some degree. And that, however, showed this early attempt to concentrate power in the hands of a major line. And we will see how, effectively, the Kingdom of Croatia that was, as we were saying before, traditionally founded around 925 under Tomislav, that at least is, we, we say so because the popes in their chancery called him Rex, right, for the first time, in, in, for a Croatian ruler, so that what became the kingdom, right, but of course it was a gradual expansion, but in any case, of course, this corresponded to a major concentration of power that derived also from Christianization, the establishment of ecclesiastical administration, and uh, in parallel, of course, the, the consolidation of political military control uh, on the area. So, um, uh, onomastically speaking, we talk about uh, Dalmatinska, Kratska, and uh, Primozhka, uh, Kratska as modern appellations of respectively the Dalmatian and the littoral Croatia. Uh, historically, uh, sometimes the Dutch is called principality as well for the same reason. Again, the, the term dux in Latin stresses mostly the military character of leader, like that literally means. Whereas princeps, as you know, is like the first among equals. So there was no formality in this titles in practice. They meant substantially the same thing. So there was a ferocious competition between, uh, I mean, among the, the various Croatian leaders. And um, the, um, the the first recorded name for the duchy is Land of the Croats, in Latin Regnum Croatorum, in the mid ninth century. But uh, it was not factually a, a kingdom, as we were saying, uh, in the sense of a established monarchy, right? So it was just Regnum, mean, meaning realm of the Croatians altogether. Um, in Greek, uh, the Byzantine sources, they called them Krobatia, so Croatia, basically. Um, well, the first known duke, Borna, was named Dux Dalmatia, so stressing the control, and, and later Dux Dalmatia Atque Liburnia, so ruler of these um, essentially coastal areas uh, of the eastern shores of the Adriatic Sea, and this term, terminology, comes from the Annales Regni Francorum, that as we will see, documented some important events at the time of Borna. And uh, the Croatian name starts, you know, being well documented, properly as a kind of a national reality, in the Latin meaning of the term, during the second half of the 19th, uh, of the 9th century. And Tripmir I was named Dux Croatorum, Duke of the Croats, in a Latin charter issued, in fact, in the, in the mid 9th century. While um, the uh, well, Branimir was defined as Dux Croatorum on an inscription we find in Shopot near Benkovac um, 
meaning Duke, Duke of the Croats. So also a bit more of a geographical look at this. Um, as we were saying at the beginning, the Croats uh, dwelled in this the former Roman province of Dalmatia. Right, in this area existed various tribal groupings that we're not particularly informed about, but we know they were called the Sclavini by the Byzantines um, during the migration era. So Slavs, and these were groups that had moved, as as you know, all across um, the Central Europe and and the Balkans, uh, and that coming in, in this direction to to settle in kind of the most advanced areas of the Mediterranean. Um, and the, the Balkans, as you know, had gone under, undergone a militarization. Also, properly, the Danubian frontier had been depopulated, etc. Uh, the Slavs arrived at the latest, right after the other had moved in terribly um, poor times for, for everybody. Um, so, as we will see also, the, the gestation of more solid political realities was, was difficult because still, however, the Byzantines maintained an important control on the more developed areas. Uh, from the other side, also the uh, the gods, the Longbirds, did. Uh, there were surely some groups of Germans. We know it, this this is debated, especially when we pick the... Uh, we try to explain the etymology of certain terminologies, such as, for example, the ban. Uh, the, as you know, will become the Banate of Croatia later on, the Banate of Bosnia, etc. This is a term that some uh, associate, for example, to the Avar Bayan. Uh, there is also a, a name in Slav uh, in the Balkans, ba Bojan. It's, it's kind of maybe derived from that. Some instead think it was a Germanic identification with that. Also, the sources sometimes draw parallelisms between Germanic and Slavic mythology uh, for, for complicating uh, the issue. So, this is not much of a deal. Uh, the Slavs were quite primitive and warlike, and they bore always basically the name of whatever uh, name plus the suffix Slav, which means glory. And some of their names were very uh, symbolic in many ways, like it's, I don't know, most Germanic names were also during the migration, but not really, like we call them historiographically like that, but they were not like personally named like that. Those were broader nicknames that had more, mostly to do with a political military character, and this dates back to everything we can we can remember even among the Celts and so on um, and the, uh, the, the so you have essentially Eastern Adriatic interland on one side then parts of Western Herzegovina today Western Central Bosnia then into uh, Lika, Gaska and um, Krbava and Northwest of Vinodol and Labin in the Croatian literal area these were mostly the lands occupied by the Croats uh, um, later on, and at, at this um, point, uh, the uh, bef before the Croatian settlement, several coastal Dalmatian cities were under Byzantine control, including, in fact, the largest, most important ones, such as Split, um, Zara, Zadar, Kotor, Dubrovnik, as well as the islands of uh, Kvar and Kirk. Um, as you know, these areas would later be taken over by the Venetians, who maintain control in there, and um, and these labs remaining as uh, even I don't know. Think about the Ushkoks, like in the modern age, uh, up to still up to this kind of kind of more um, or traditional, if you want, and autonomous reality in the interland, right? More more primitive, it's kind of also warlike and connected to piracy in this amphibious. Um, scenario. In fact, the uh, to the south, Croatia bordered with the aforementioned Narentines uh, that were pirates and remained kind of out of the games, even of the church, for a long time until they were crushed by the Venetians in, in the 10th century, so that in the 11th we basically stopped hearing about them. And this area stretched from the rivers uh, Cetina to, the, uh, to Neretva and had the islands of Bratz, Hvar, Korsula, Miliet, Vis and Lastovo. Also in southern Dalmatia there was Zaumlje, Travunia and Dioclea, today Montenegro. And the north of Croatia also bordered with the Duchy of Lower Pannonia. It was a Slavic power. It's kind of it's not extremely famous, at least in popular culture, but it was an important entity. 
that uh, had a similar story, especially to to the Duchy of Croatia. Uh, aside from, you know, somewhat the ethnic proximity, but the role they had under the Carolingians. And as we were saying before, there were several centers of Croatia in general. Every duke had a, let's say, a preferred residence, uh, and this could be in various places of of, uh, of the country. And courts began to develop at some point, documented properly. But there is to consider that, of course, great part of the uh, you know the the, the infrastructure etc was present already uh, was of Roman origin but these were also somewhat the more the more exposed centers uh, it would happen as we will see now that the, the when an enemy invaded and and especially was like more of a as you would call a conventional force that they would mostly be able at some point to threaten the centers, but they had great difficulties, and this is a bit the the entire history of you know the Western uh, Frankish warfare. Let's go in this way against the Slavs, not to storm the traditional Slavic fortresses um, on hilltops in forests, swamps, etc., where the majority of the population even was habituated to 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 retreat into and uh, obliging fundamentally the the larger armies to abandon the country very often also kind of with, with logistical difficulties um you know malaria things like this so they're very rough times the slavics uh, uh, the slavs as always were fanatic defenders this is the the picture that we get from early medieval warfare um and in fact croatia was essentially not conquered by anybody other, other major competitor of course that we didn't name is the whoever settled in the in the carpathian basin uh, in the Pannonian Plain, uh, in the west of the Avars, especially the and the Magyars later, and okay for later times that we don't talk about today, of course the the Kingdom of Hungary as it had developed from there, um, and the most important center uh, in Croatia was arguably, like in relative terms, Klis near Split. Uh, this was the residence of Duke Tripmer the, the first. Uh, other dukes resided in this other towns of Solin, Knin, Biazzi and Nin, as we mentioned before. So, in theory, at, at the moment of the Croatian migration in, in this land, uh, most of Dalmatia uh, was under the Avar Khaganate, talking about the 7th century. So the Avars had migrated from the Eurasian steppes and established this important power that was consolidating, in fact, exactly at this point, to, as a major one, but still couldn't fundamentally control directly all the outskirts of its dominions. Uh, the Slavic tribes that had also in part moved under these so-called shepherds of people, such as Turkic peoples like the Avars, etc., um, were formally subjugated, but they still dwelt more in, in the surroundings and enjoying some degree of autonomy, and it was difficult also in the more um, mountainous and forested areas outside of, of the of the Hungarian steppe for our heavy cavalry and the, the, the massive um, you know military that they had also with dramatic siege capabilities etc think about the siege of Constantinople etc could operate right this was, was a, a huge problem as always it's not that the Slavs had a dramatically high uh, military quality but uh, their their territories were very difficult to occupy but also because they, they, they lacked centralization and they could live in conditions that uh, were not enough to maintain greater mm, military systems. So this had been the problem in general, of, I don't know, even again of the Romans against the Germans or the, the Celtic French, always the same thing. So guerrilla was pretty much out there, and the Slavs knew pr very well how to exploit terrain in this regard, as we will see later also in their victory uh, against the, the Bulgars, uh, the, Bul the Bulgarians arguably at that point uh, later on. So, um, the the Slavs participated to the same other rates because they were kind of used as the um, you know the the throwaway infantry that was still necessary for the other heavy cavalry to operate right the others had everything good except infantry right so the Slavs were co-opted let's put it in this way to provide also that important bulk of uh, of foot forces that you need to occupy to maintain position everywhere in, in all warfare. Um, universally um, and 
the Avars had accomplished this great feat in 614 of destroying the, the beautiful city of Salona in, in the, the capital of the province of Dalmatia and managed to retain control of the region for some time, some decades, a few decades actually until in fact the Croats arrived right so speaking of the Croats the the, the easy explanation of who they were is that they, they were Slavs originating in fact according to the you know to the much debated ethnogenesis um, of the Slavs and the proto-Slavs in the area around the Pripyat marshes or so-called marshes action that um, in fact began to expand further and the Croats would have been first documented uh, around the Carpathian area for which they would have moved in part west, northwest, um, in central Europe, uh, with the white Cro Croats existing, you know, for, for up to in fact the contemporary age as a distant kind of ethnic group, and part of them settling, in fact, in what would have become Croatia in the south. Uh, the same a bit like is for the Sorabs, the Serbs, right? It's just that we we don't have uh, like the limpid evidence of, of all of this just we with you know it's plausible it's uh, you know it, it does provide with with a sound theory for explaining this but of course these movements were also quite blended with many other elements right you know we've seen turkic iranian elements uh the idea is that again it was this a bit this the stereotype of the uh of the brutal nomadic lord of the steppe what whichever the origin like it could be in, i don't know Sarmatians, Iranians, uh, or Turks, etc. And the Slavs that were just dramatically unstratified societies, like still tribesmen uh, without much of powerful elites, uh, that would simply follow them. Uh, the, the picture, like, it, as a pattern of interpretation, is kind of correct, but of course there were important Slavic powers that uh, just eventually were not documented also because mostly we know that from the radar of Constantinople that documented ethnographically these peoples very loosely and there were important Slavic powers scattered all around there were mostly clans that joined together in confederacies etc but there were also powerful uh, hierarchies elites right um, and lords uh, that acted at some point with some degree of political cohesion uh, in the area uh, the area also, as you know, ethnically is quite mixed. There is an important Mediterranean Pelasgian element, uh, plus you find this incredibly Nordic, uh, Pontic types, uh, Turkic elements. So it's um, it's quite of a blend. But generally speaking, at least we, we think w whichever the, the the elite that might have guided the, these peoples, that the majority were Slavs, were kind of pretty similar. You know, especially, but much more similar at the time to uh, to, to Germanoid types reciprocally the Slavs, and eventually also the, the massive waves of nomads from the steppe, especially in in Eastern Europe, but also still in the Balkans in Central Europe, would kind of dilute uh, in some in some way. And in fact, especially Croatians and Serbians, as you know, are some of the tallest people in Europe, and you you see again this uh, incredibly fair and you know also impressively sized individuals and this speaks not just of an ethnic origin but also of, of an a radically and traumatically brutal reality that they lived into uh, also after they settled in this lands because they were always in fact as we will see in between other powers that tried always to subjugate them uh, Franks, Avars, Magyars, Bulgars, Byzantines etc and they kind of also Entrenched, in fact, uh, like the Serbs, etc., always in, in the, the Danaric Alps, etc., and trying to have resort always to this ferocious guerrillas that still lasted up to, you know, throughout Ottoman times and beyond. And um, the the first, uh, so the Croats arrived in in this area that again the Avars and their Slavic subjects already s controlled loosely in a way. The first, the earliest recorded Croatian leader is uh, referred to by the Emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus, as we will see now, um, is, um, is Porca. And this, that's where also where also the, the, the problem of the etymology, whether it was Slavic or Germanic or, or, or even Iranian, Turkic, whatever comes uh, on the fore, uh, hotly debated topics. I'm not going to descend in these questions uh, for now, at least. Um, and after... The um, 
the, the, their participation in Samos and Kubrat's Bulgarian defeat of the Avars in 632, the White Croats were likely invited into Dalmatia by the Byzantine Emperor Heraclius in the first half of the 7th century and allowed to settle there. Or um, it, it, it may have just taken place autonomously as it they most of these mi migrations would always be right it was always some power that was kind of um controlling in some way that these movements but in part they, they they could not be stopped right so there might have been a just a breakthrough these peoples made at uh, the following also of other peoples in fact the samos the so-called empire or the the bulgarians at the expense of the other and that they they pour through right um, and uh, surely those were moments of intense uh, war uh, so say whatever the other establishment in the region was was significantly crippled at least in the in the outskirts right this was always the deal for any empire at the time if there is internal strife as would always happen you basically lose control of the periphery then there is a re-expansional phase and then this thing kind of crumbles on again. So the Croats exploited this. They migrated across the Saba from the uh, Pannonia Savia area and settled in Dalmatia. Again, probably on their own, right? Whether they might have had the Byzantine blessing, but in an anti-hour function, but they essentially would migrate just for seizing the southern lands uh, on their own. There was a, a period of, of other power revival, let's say, that retook Pannonia in, six, in 677, so we are on the um, eastern watershed of the Dinaric Den Alps, um, and this control would, however, stop to the Sava and the Danube rivers. So at the beginning of the 9th century, Croatia emerged, as we will see now, as a, as a political entity with a duke at the head of a, some countess clans fundamentally the Jupania uh, and territorially we're talking about the basins of the rivers Cetina, Kirka and Zmania there were 11 Jupania uh, that would be under the duchy mm -hmm. so you understand what it is there were essentially 11 clans major clans or tribes whatever you want to call them and um, they uh, and there would be somebody trying to hegemonize the wolf group all right and the mantus hostilis of the surrounding peoples keeping them kind of politically coins so according to the uh, de administrando imperio source the croats in pannonia were subject to the franks for for some time quote as they had formerly been in their own country um, and until they rebelled and defeated the franks after a seven years war this uh, war is uh, apparently undocumented, at least we can't trace it to the, to the Croats. We don't know even where it, it happened, factually, because the Franks controlled um, surely a great part of the Danubian Valley up to the Middle Danube by a certain degree. We made recently a video about Bavaria. You know how, let's say, the, the Germanic control stretched further east across the valley, um, there are certain areas that historically would be Germanized by the Ostsiedlung, even across the Sudeten, the Carpathians. So they're the same areas that kind of, you know, where the Croats came from. So we, we don't understand um, I now what this source really means, being, you know, under Frankish control within, especially their own lands, right, in their own country. Uh, it may be an approximation, an exaggeration. Uh, it's unlikely that the Croats had dwelled in some you know, properly Frankish lands, but they had probably been under the the Merovingian sphere of influence by a certain uh, time, and they probably did rebel, and they probably did cause the Franks some damage, given that, again, they were quite unruly people that were also difficult to dislodge from wherever they settled, especially in those areas that were kind of rougher in Central Europe, and they would give plenty of you know of uh, of, of, of chances to, to defend uh, uh, against the union there what the Franks were already developing even before Carolingian times is kind of the heavier 
cavalry, etc., where they would just hide because of the other raids that also hit the same Frankish territories. So uh, the important thing, though, um, is that from we, co we quote the the, the Administrando Imperio uh, by the, the four aforementioned Constantine the Seventh Porphyrogenitus. Um, from that point on, they, the the Croats were independent and demanded to be baptized from the Bishop of Rome, as we will see what happened. Um, and was sent to them to be baptized in the time of Porinus, their prince. Their land was divided in 11 supanias, which are Lebiana, Cenzena, Emota, Pleba, Pesenta, Paratalassia, Brebere, Nona, Thnena, Zidraga, Nina. And their ban, so this noble title used for several states in Central and Southern, uh, Southeastern Europe, from starting from the 7th century, has Kribazan, Litzan, Gut, uh, and as we'll see, even though the Croats would be converted to Christianity, especially their elites that were interested also in securing their patrimonial assets with monastic foundations and all, still by the 9th century it's fair to say that uh, a part, if not the majority, probably of Croats were, were, were pagan still. And there were pagans around uh, still. The others didn't convert, there were still Slavs that were pagan, in quite close in the areas we've seen with the Narentines, etc. Now, Frankish vassalage began, as you can intuitively guess uh, chronologically here, uh, in Carolingian times, where the Franks conquered the Longobard kingdom, they uh, regained uh, direct control of, the, of Bavaria, uh, of the Danubian Valley, and destroying the uh, the other Kaganate, they uh, gained control of Pannonia and Dalmatia. Uh, we're talking about essentially the uh, the 90s of the 8th and the 10th of the 9th century. And in 788, Charlemagne himself, um, coming from Italy at that point, turned further east and subjugated Istria that, as we've seen, was probably like a contended land historical between the Longobards um, and, and the Slavs. And in the 90s, the uh, Duke Voinmir of Pannonia, right, so uh, accepted, in the north of Croatia, accepted the Frankish overlordship, right, and as such, his land was uh, placed under the mark of Friuli uh, that uh, would essentially uh, catch Croatia under two fires, right? And this was the attempt, essentially, of the of the Frankish margraves from northeastern Italy to try to extend their rule over Dalmatia and uh, the Croatians. In 799, the Franks, under the leadership of Eric of Friuli, who was margrave of uh, German origin, uh, were defeated at the Battle of Trzat in Liburnia. It was a, an important battle in which uh, the same Eric died, by the way. It was a hell of a loss and uh, it was uh, one of the typical battles fought actually to relieve the siege of Trzat. That um, actually I think the modern town dates back to later times when it was re refounded uh, somewhere in, in the nearby because the Franks were besieging uh, the older one at this point and eventually would manage to destroy it later on. That's why, why the, the Croats also would withdraw sometimes to their impregnable fortresses and forests and swamps, etc. Um, but some think that uh, we didn't have the details, but we think that at the time, given the enormous attrition that had, uh, that especially the Longobard conquest, uh, the Frankish conquest of um, of, of uh, Longobardy had caused between the Franks and the Byzantines. Um, there was some, in fact, Byzantine participation in the battle. Uh, some authors think that even the, the relics of the Avars or um, in the Pannonian era would participate also against uh, the Franks in support of the Croatian. Um, and in any case, uh, from 803, Carolingian rule was recognized in most of northern Dalmatia. There weren't really many many options there. Things were would be gradually settled in favor of the Franks in the area and just the were the greatest power and so some kind of um, you know compromise had to be found there. Um, the uh, so these were the southeasternmost 
fringes of, of the Carolingian Empire, right? So consider also the, you know, the, the, the necessity of investing in it. But they were very important, again, because the area of Dalmatia was essentially a Byzantine thing, right? And now the renewed Carolingian power was a hell of a threat uh, in the area. And, in fact, at the time, the Franks and the Byzantines were really actually fighting, right? Uh, and they finally settled with the Pax Nicephori, the sphere of influence, let's say, in the area, in 812. Um, this is an important uh, milestone, let's say, in, in European history, because it also the, uh, the, the crucial um, entity that was battled over was Venice, actually. The, the Dutch of Venice at that point had been Byzantine, it would kind of remaining under the influence, but that was uh, increasing between the two empires, its autonomy, if not de facto independence. Uh, Charlemagne's son died in the Venetian lagoons of Malaria trying to storm Venice, right? So that's how important politically and strategically the center was. Um, and in fact, the Carolingians would use the Venetians later on also to try, in fact, to maintain control on the Adriatic, also in anti-Croatian uh, fashion. Uh, there was a great involvement right, in, in, that, um, in that area, an increasing one, as you know, historically, from the Lagoon City. Um, with the Treaty of 812, the Byzantines had retained control of the coastal cities and islands of Dalmatia that fundamentally could could not be you know threatened by by the Franks they were mostly like a land power they should have mounted up massive uh, a massive logistical effort and creation of a fleet just for you know controlling those centers was not really crucial I mean all the problems that the Franks had to, to control that this enormous European landmass that really were others. Uh, however, the Carolingians were recognized by the Byzantines, a rule over at least previously claimed in fact, uh, territory um, uh, of Istria and the Dalmatian interland. Mm -hmm. So that's how Croatia kind of fell under the Frankish sphere of influence. Like more of a, in fact, more of a continental reality. Um, Around the first decade, decade of the 9th century, the Croatian Duke Borna, who resided in Nin, ruled most of northern Dalmatia uh, as a vassal of the Carolingians. Um, also, Borna was Duke of the Guduscani, there was a Croatian tribe living along the river Gudusa near Briber, northern Dalmatia, from which the core of the uh, Croatian royal heartland would, would emerge fundamentally so there are always areas that are kind of for some reason better in doubt than others also just because they escape maybe some some greater pressure but just because of the uh, necessarily just with local resources in any case um, Barna's rule was marked by the rebellion of Ludovic Posavsky that was in fact another Slavic lord who uh, fundamentally had rebelled against Frankish oppression, right? So you have to imagine, of course, that the Carolingians were not really tender-hearted people. Um, Borna was essentially their man in the land, so any kind of um, disgruntlement uh, from the Croatian side was simply due to Frankish abuse, as it would happen, uh, because there were Frankish agents and, and lords kind of operating in the area. Uh, would uh, spread this kind of rebellions. Um, Ludovic defeated the same Borna in 819 in, in a battle somewhere near the river Kupa and began at that point uh, to uninjuredly ravaging Dalmatia to cripple essentially the, the ducal and therefore Frankish establishment um, in the influence in the land. Uh, however, he was essentially out, mm, outmatched by Frankish uh, forces, even just numerically, and that's uh, he's. In fact, this is the moment in which the Franks managed to invade the land again to curb this rebellion, and Borna could, at some point, h hold them for a very brief time, especially along the rivers, etc. But would always be forced to retreat. 
and finally in fact the main centers uh, controlled by Ludovic were were kind of stormed and many of his following took refuge in this um, in forests swamps and hilltops uh, heavily fortified centers that the Franks couldn't really go on and they uh, there was a um, an ep epidemic spreading also in the Frankish army uh, coming back across the especially the marshes etc and so nobody really was a winner we could see um, Borna died in 821 and he was succeeded by his nephew Vladislav now as you've seen the Croatians were still fundamentally between the the Frankish and Byzantine uh, sphere of influence um, in a way and the the contact with Constantinople were important especially through the coastal cities because these were the market centers and there was some special law for the um, for the Croatians properly from the interland um, this is a a trade route in Europe that is often overlooked, lasted for centuries and centuries, arguably still today, by the way, with the coastal centers of the Adriatic and the Slavic uh, interland, mostly a pastoral economy, as you can imagine, it's also because the interland is all kind of mountains, and uh, that's it, but there was also some crossing uh, with, with the, the, more, the further Balkan interland connections with the same uh, Bulgarians, which Croatia was basically the bridge. Uh, to to Italy to to the papacy as, as we've seen also in other videos we'll see now there was this ferocious struggle uh, over the conversion of the Bulga of the Bulgars by Constantinople and Rome so Croatia even in there played an important part um, in the second quarter of the ninth century the Croats boosted their naval capabilities and joined the Narentines uh, that were still pagan in uh, you know in attacking uh, ships uh, especially the Venetian ones right and this causing naturally a, a reaction the Venetians in 839 under Doge Pietro Tradonico attacked the eastern coast of the Adriatic including Croatia um, and yeah, I mean, the, the Venetian Navy was already something, but they couldn't really storm the interland, right? So they would hope to cause damage to, to these strongholds that were more readily, um, you know, exposed uh, along the coast. And they were, however, forced to peace with um, the Croatian ruler, the Princeps Mislav, in Latin, Principe Muisclavo, right? Who, uh, at the time, ruled from Clis near split and this was um, it was also a, s a treaty signed at a place named St. Martin also the Narentines were attacked by Venice but uh, even in this case uh, there was no possible strategic conclusivity say. so there was a peace also made with them so this was a tit for tat strategy like most strategy was really at the time um, and the, um, at least the, the John the Diacon, who is, was a Venetian, uh, in fact, Diacon secretary to the Doge of Venice in a chronicle, uh, mentions Count Drosaico um, as leader of the Narentine to the time. Um, and war would break out soon uh, again. Uh, in, in the following year, even, the Narentines managed to defeat the Venetians led, uh, I mean the Renatines being led by their Count Du Ditum, right, and piracy went on in the Adriatic, this was gradually a moment of, you know, f newly fragmentation of power by a certain degree, especially from the Carolingian side, um, and the hostility towards Venice increased, um, and this is readily evident when you realize that the Emperor Lothar I uh, was actively supporting the Doge to properly entrust the Venetians with the defense of the Italian cities and Istria from the Slavic attacks at sea and on land. Uh, Tripmir I, in eight, uh, around 845, um, 
succeeded Duke Mislav in Croatia and the, the general Croatian status internationally remained the one of Frankish vassals under Lothar the um, first however Trpmer, Trpmer uh, worked to increase importantly his own power his own rule in the uh, in the land he's considered the founder of the Trpmirovic dynasty that uh, would rule, albeit with interruptions of course, in, in the land until the end of the 11th century. At this point, uh, the Mediterranean was being ravaged by the Avars. Right? So, um, the Byzantine Empire suffered consistently of this, also the Franks were having trouble with that, Venice had trouble with that, of which the Croatian Duke took advantage. In fact, Trpimir successfully attacked the Byzantine coastal cities and the Patricius that was ruling there and between 854 and 80, uh, 86 he also managed to repel a Bulgarian invasion under uh, the Kniaz Boris the uh, first of uh, some somewhere in northeastern Bo uh, Bosnia uh, we don't know exactly where and um, after that, securing in fact a peace with the Bulgarian Empire that uh, lasted consistently it was a you know a peace treaty, some gifts exchange. Uh, Croatia was naturally the westernmost land that uh, the, the Bulgarians could come to you know to put under pressure, depending on the very alternating uh, alliances that were taking place in the game between the Carolingians, uh, Constantinople, and other central. European powers, by the way, in the meanwhile, so um, it was difficult objectively to even subdue an area like Croatia to make a successful, you know, the, you know, to, to tame it successfully. Same goes for the Serbians by, by a certain degree. Uh, still, however, they were permeable enough lands to at least, uh, in terms cost benefits ratio, even in the absence of a major victory, to 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 gain something special from the loot, as you can imagine, uh, and uh, still in this time, Co uh, Constantine the Seventh for Philogenitus m mentions, however, the traditional friendship between the Bulgarians and the Croatians. And there is a Latin charter preserved in our rewrite, actually from 1568. You can uh, insert it even here in the pictures. It's kind of you know pretty fact. Renaissance like, but this uh, dated to March the 4th, 852, or some say uh, according to a new research, uh, 840, where Trpmir, Pimir, I will never uh, pronounce it correct, uh, refers to himself as Dux Croatorum Juvatus Munere Divino and calling his own land, in fact, Renium Croatorum, that as we have seen doesn't really mean that he styled himself as, as Rex, as a matter of fact he styled himself as Dux, but speaking of the realm of the Croats altogether, which is an important ideological assessment in the, you know, formation, probably a Croatian identity, politically, nationally, at that point. Uh, as, as you understand, at this point, we'll see it better, Croatia was kind of autonomizing itself at the gradual decline of Byzantine and Frankish influence under the Islamic um, piracy that was, um, you know, a, an option to revive, in fact, the, the, the this Croatian power, right, that would have been uh, more in check, more on the offense, even against the surrounding powers exploiting the situation. And um, the uh, the same charter documents uh, three premier uh, possession of the fortress of Clis, right? It was, as we've seen, basically the most important was a, a Roman for fortification there that eventually was built upon the Middle Ages, right? So, important center and where Tripemir ruled properly. And also, the charter mentions Mislav's donations to the Archbishopric of Split. So, a document instilled this important ecclesiastical connection between the Croatian ducal power and, and, the, and the church, also kind of internationally. So, 
there was a court uh, in uh, let's say uh, in in Clis, and next to it at the uh, town of uh, uh, Rijinitsa, Tripemir built a church and the first Benedictine monastery in Croatia, which can be seen as in part as a continuation of some uh, ecclesiastical policy, but also this wave of uh, monastic foundation which taking place in the Carolingian Empire, probably something among the Byzantines to also to put properly at um, to, to keep safely um, some assets in the face of this um, not just not much of the international situation but also properly of the foundation of a sort of quasi dynastic power as, as we've seen uh, that the that Tripmere family would, would in fact achieve um, with the house of Tripimirovich and from the time we have also uh, an inscription on a stone fragment from an altar screen of the Rijinitsa monastery church that bears Trepemir's name. The instability of the system is however evidenced by the usurpation of uh, the throne um, after the death of Trepemir uh, uh, by the Duke Domagoj of the house of the Domagojevich, right? So this is important because from one side you see that you know yeah, there is not yet a, a solid monarchic single power but at the same time you see that there are houses emerging right something so more compact than you know the, the clanic migration era style culture and th this means that Croatia was develop uh, developing politically uh, institutionally socially um, uh, Domagoj forced uh, Tripmir uh, Pimir of oh my God, how can I pronounce this name? It's so simple after all, and and forces his sons, including uh, Zdeslav, uh, to flee to Constantinople. Uh, this is interesting because you see that you know the Byzantines were always in between, hoping to to regain some control in these areas, but and they they would increasingly, in fact, side with with Croatia, as we will see now, um, especially in anti-Bulgarian fashion. But that happened later on, telling the truth. Um, and the um, uh, so some of, of Trpimir sons would actually rule themselves later on as dukes. I think just I don't remember whether just the last uh, third one, but still. Um, so Domagoj is an interesting figure because um, he seems to have uh, triggered. He has been actually led a sort of uh, anti-Christian policy in Croatia, right? A bit uh, of a leap backwards uh, in the path of Christianization. Probably as a, rea a reaction to this uh, foreign influence, um, like, in fact, the, main, the, the universal Christian empires that had, uh, in fact, uh, you know, had, had some, some pressure on Croatia. And also their 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 weakening, right? Eight hundred sixty four. This is the moment the Carolingian Empire was had already fallen apart. Practically, was uh, had split. Its capacity was was uh, uh, say declining further. Um, and uh, under Domagoj, the Slavic pirates attacked Christian sailors including a ship with papal legates that were returning from the Eighth uh, Catholic Ecumenical Council um, in, Con in Constantinople. And this forced the Pope to, you know, to ask for explanations, uh, and especially to uh, asking for the stop of piracy to Domagoj. But the Croatian ruler wouldn't quite listen. Um, however, Domagoj was really fighting a bit against everybody, with the Arabs, the Venetians, the Franks alike. And in, in 871, he even helped, actually, the Franks uh, as their vassal to seize Bari from the Arabs that, as you know, had established an emirate there. This was a major um, accomplishment of the um, 
Carolingian Kingdom of Italy with a great military and logistical force that also showed off in front of the Byzantines that still had quite some, I mean, Bari was a, essentially a Byzantine city before it had been taken by the Arabs, so showing what still, in particular, the Italic Kingdom could, could could do at that point. This is like the last tail strike before the crisis of the 10th century in Europe um, from the side of Carolingian powers. And uh, the Croatians participated, right? Because they still were vassals of the Franks after all. However, uh, after the, um, say, under the rule of Carloman of, of Bavaria, uh, that uh, was, was a troubled one in... Um, in the, in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom. And so this uh, important power that together with Italy was, as we've seen, taking Croatia from, from both, from, from the north side at that point, Domagoj led a revolt against the same Franks. And this revolt was even, even successful. So much that the Frankish overlordship in Dalmatia ended, practically for good at that point. There was... Um, still some control the Franks retained on lower Pannonia, on the eastern side. So this is important because uh, it shows rather the the fact that Croatia was kind of more difficult to reach from, uh, let's say, um, it was more across the Central European and Mediterranean reality, and uh, it was more difficult f by f from, the, from Eastern Francia to, to be brought under, right? And... Uh, Italy also wasn't really undertaking any effort to, to, to extend its power over Croatia that had kind of more pressuring problems to think about. Um, and as I understand, the Frankish weakening, however, triggered an increased Byzantine influence in Croatia, right? So much that the Byzantines established the theme of Dalmatia uh, at the time. Uh, I don't know whether this was Domagoj's intention by a certain degree. They, he probably thought that surely the, the Frankish pressure was greater, as we've seen Croatia had fallen mostly in that sphere of influence, so it was better to back the Byzantines uh, in return. But it's not so directly and limpidly evident, right? Also, considering the Croatian participation at uh, the siege of Bari. Um, but after the death of Domagoj in 876, Zdeslav, as we've seen, yes, actually, uh, one of uh, Trypemir sons who had fled to Constantinople came back to Croatia and managed to restore uh, the house of Trypemirovich uh, over the one, uh, over the son, in fact, of one of the sons, that we, whose name we don't know, of Domagoj and also restoring peace with Venice in 878. Uh, which is interesting because it shows how probably he, you know, both as a Croatian and as a, in part, a, a Byzantine instrument, would want to keep up at least with some kind of maritime trade dimension and this kind of um, say Adriatic Sea as a bit of a Byzantine lake idea uh, still at the time and reviving trade also in Croatia uh, accordingly and as we've seen the team of Dalmatia had been repristinated before and uh, maybe uh, so you understand that this Croatian dukes were also a bit in between the contingencies right uh, there was no way to kind of support one side and not seeing a greater influence of the other in their land. And this is witnessed also by the internal instability that would, would follow by a certain degree. Um, Duke uh, Zvetoslav's reign was short, it ended in 879, and Duke Branimir of the house of Domagoyevich uh, usurped the throne after having killed, in fact, Zetislav himself. Um, so this internal strife is fascinating because you can argue that just as the Carolingian Empire and surrounding countries, this, this, there was a fragmentation once again from the internal. Um, and uh, again, the, the 
the, the lack of uh, a sovereign power in, in regionally or even continentally would lead to yes to maybe some expansion of autonomies but as a uh, locally but as a consequence just in the post Carolingian world right to, to an expansion of private rule however it was a concerted for to keep um, Croatia together in fact Branimir was clever uh, to make Croatia come back unequivocally uh, differently from what had happened under Domago, uh, Domagoj that uh, he embodied uh, politically as his successor to, come to make Croatia come back again uh, in under the Roman Church. In fact, he had regular correspondence with Pope John VIII uh, showing his predisposition to entrust Croatia to the Apostolic See. And naturally the Pope was glad um, of this and uh, this brought importantly enough to the to recognition, a recognition of Croatia as an independent state free of Frankish suzerainty. The Popes could afford this uh, now the, the Carolingian Empire was about to to die completely at this point the second half of the ninth century uh, in fact witnessed uh, a, an expansion of papal influence in in the Balkans uh, as there were problems going on also between Constantinople and Bulgaria uh, we made a video just recently about this competition uh, between uh, Rome and Constantinople were probably the Balkans, Central Europe, and also further east um, at some point. And uh, Pope John VIII uh, lamented uh, the obstination of the Patriarch of Constantinople, Ignatius, to Domagoj, uh, and this had to do with the insistence of the Byzantine insistence on claiming jurisdiction over Bulgaria right, by appointing a new archbishop there and so this means that the Pope was seeing Croatia also as a sort of pawn to interfere in that business in the Balkans. Um, the Pope also requested from Duke Zdeslav uh, so independently from the, the the dynastic continuity and, and Branimir assistance and protection for his legates who were crossing in fact Croatia on their way to Bulgaria and the in fact the aim there was evident Bulgaria naturally was much more important than Croatia for 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 the popes for for Constantinople it was just a larger power and kind of a looming threat on on the Byzantine Empire that uh, the popes could could use to make leverage uh, and there to to, to increase more power on their own and from this papal let's say interest in Croatia as a kind of a uh, path to to the Balkans geographically we can hypothesize that at this point uh, Croatia controlled some parts of Bosnia uh, as well Right, uh, and that at least the the frontier with Bulgaria was essentially that land. In fact, it would become also the seat of later military operation in, in the war against the two uh, the two powers. Munzimir, also known as Mutimir, was the y uh, youngest son of Tripimir, came to the throne after the death of Branimir. So, the house of Tripimirovits once again. This happened around 892. There is a Latin charter from Biazzi near Trajir that dates to September 28, 892, which calls Munzimir Crotorum Dux. So at least we know that he was recognized in a way as self citing himself, however, as Duke of Croatia. And in this time a major event came to, you know, modify consistently the regional power balance. At this point 
Croatia had surely benefited uh, in part from the uh, relief pressure uh, followed to this, the destruction of the other Kaganate. Yes, the Carolingians had kind of been a pain in the behind, but at the same time, it was just a huge vacuum. And when we talk also about the, the Bosnian era, maybe was caused also uh, the, the Croatian expansion uh, towards that direction was also caused by, in fact, the, the lack of any major power in, in the uh, Carpathian Basin. I mean, technically, that was namely at least on under Bulgarian control, but there were some important back and forths also with um, the Great Moravia uh, in the Pannonian Basin, in the, the Carolingians, the Bulgarians, that really created a vacuum of power which probably the same Croatians in part at least benefited um, because they, they didn't have much nor of a northeastern pressure anymore. At this point, instead, uh, the Magyars come in the scene and, and that will be the, the problem of Croatia basically for the entirety of its history um, until at least, let's say, the, the end of World War I, the disgregation of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, as uh, this uh, fierce Ugrofinnic nomadic people settled, more or less, where in fact the Hans, the, the Avars had, had already been settled and just being factually next door uh, to Croatia uh, itself. And, uh, the, and, and not only, but Croatia was in the way to Italy, and we know that the Magyars raided extensively basically all the post Carolingian kingdoms. Western Francia, Eastern Francia, and Italy, and Croatia was kind of in the middle, and so it found itself in a quite um, you know delicate position because from one side you had pressure on your own land and also devastations as a consequence, but still you wouldn't really want to to anger too much the Magyars, um, etc. So a, a new ba interesting balance formed. Now Munsimir ruled up to around the first decade of, of the 10th century was succeeded by Tomislav that is actually the, as we were saying in the beginning, the founder of the kingdom of Croatia, uh, not much of the duke of the land uh, anymore and he was a hell of a character and in fact kind of deserves um, the, you know, at least this preeminence it's not just symbolic in Croatian history and the development of his country. Um, there is a Venetian chronicler, the aforementioned John the Deacon, writing in 912 that a Venetian ambassador that was coming uh, back to Venice from, from Bulgaria, so again they, they would use the same papal route, right? they, they, they crossed Croatian territory before reaching the land of Zahum, uh, yeah, suggesting uh, that um, again, that Croatia bordered with Bul Bulgaria at the time, uh, the, the Bulgarian Empire was ruled at the time by the great uh, Simeon I. There is also um, a 13th century work by Thomas the Archdeacon of Split that is known as the Historia Salonitana, uh, saying that Tomislav uh, was uh, Duke of Croatia in 914, right? So he probably, as we were saying before, he kept using the, the ducal title, whereas it's just the, the papal chancellor that styled him as a as a king properly, as a rex. Also, we have the in fact the, the more uh, the contemporary the Administrando Imperio by Constantine the Seventh, uh, making a very interesting list of Croatian power that is. Uh, surely exaggerated considering the numbers and here the Byzantines wanted to stress Croatian power in a way stating that uh, the land had 100,000 infantrymen, 60,000 horsemen, 8 large ships and 100 smaller vessels. Um, we know at this point that Croatia was was, was a relevant power. They, they, they fought against the Magyars in the early 10th century for example so they were important now they scored a very important victory against Bulgaria at the time of Simeon I so they had surely an important manpower um, and we can appreciate uh, the, the number comparing it to the demographic estimates that we have of the land 
Uh, some say Croatia had something between 400,000, 800,000 people at this time. Uh, and thus, uh, forces that could be levied by this country. I mean, at the time, normally, you couldn't really levy something more than 30,000 men altogether, right? Um, the Probably the Croatians had some form of... Uh, also, um, have received some influence both from the, the Franks and the Byzantine military organization in some way, probably especially from, from the latter at that time. Their troops were divided probably in, in Alagions that were military units varying size from 50 to some hundred soldiers that appeared in fact in mid 10th later saint, um, uh, 10th century that is more or less at the same time um, and the point here is not really assessing how many troops could Croatia have because if you take these standard let's say what on paper even though paper wasn't there in Europe at the time um, uh, but let's say formally from what also later reigns will make as estimates of feudal levies later on etc you realize that it was still in theory a public universal male universal mobilization so if you have that many people let's say at least you can mobilize yeah in theory up to 100,000 men uh, or something but who's gonna do it Right, where's the political capacity of doing it? Where's the logistical capacity of supporting that? Nobody can field. What would have been the purpose of that? It would have, would have basically destroyed their entire economy in, in one day if they had tried to do that in a major organized campaign. So, of course, we're talking about what is taking shape now as kind of a more monarchic country that still has important houses, kind of in, in a, in a bipartite f faction that are backed by other by minor houses that still retain important private control in their land and that maybe in time of emergency could yeah put together something like 30,000 men uh, and also there, there was there would be surely some kind of international participation with auxiliaries uh, mercenaries of some sort right also it depends which troop we're talking about because if we um, for there are uh, there, there is evidence of from the aforementioned battles of, of the anti-Frankish revolt, for example, that there was a loss of, of one to, um, let's say, a, a number of troops that counted one to ten in terms of cavalry infantry, which is pretty probably spot on for the time, it would be kind of normal, especially in an area like Croatia that wasn't kind of so heavily stratified socially, so that uh, cavalry was maybe less uh, relevant than, I don't know, in Frankish warfare. This is also to be seen. Uh, at least the Croats would receive an important influence from uh, the neighboring steppes. In part, they would have had to fight, especially with these people. This is typical. Also, the Serbians, etc. And there were, as we've seen, as Slavs mostly um, important infantry and defense base. Uh, so maybe large numbers of men, especially in infantry, were readily available. Uh, heavy cavalry a bit less, but we shouldn't probably exaggerate at this point, surely um, in the 9th to 10th century also the Croatian equestrian, especially heavy cavalry potential was increased, but especially after the Magyar invasion probably also lots of lighter horsemen had come around, even just in frontier warfare, etc. Um, so in general it's rather by appreciation, uh, appreciating the composition of the troops rather than knowing how large their armies were that we can't say anything at this time because simply there, are, there is no evidence whatsoever of numbers. In fact, um, there there was a major clash of, in which we don't know uh, between the Croatians and the Bulgarians in 926 about which we don't know anything about the size of, of, of the two armies. Uh, this had occurred during the war between Constantinople and, and Bulgaria. When Constantinople sought the help of Croatia by concluding an alliance with... And uh, up to that point, in fact, the Bulgarians had been hammering the Byzantine army pretty hard, so much that the same Adrianople had fallen uh, and threatened, in fact, Constantinople uh, ever more. Uh, also, Simeon I in 924 had deposed 
Tsarija from the rule of Serbia. And uh, Tsarija, in fact, fled to Croatia together with, you know, Serbian refugees and trying to, uh, to, s to gain support for, uh, in an anti-Bulgarian fashion, to, to return to their land. So the next step of the Bulgarians was Croatia itself. It was invaded in 926, but the Croatians defeated the Bulgarian army at the Battle of the Bosnian Islands, where while the Bulgarian army was not uh, entirely crushed, still suffered heavy losses, probably because the, the Croatians uh, their Serbian allies were mm, kind of, they knew th the terrain better, they knew how to exploit it, especially in the mountainous lands, which, as we've seen, the, the Slavic uh, traditional warfare was better suited compared to the Bulgarian horsemen habituated to the open plains of the lower Danube. Um, and this victory was um, a big deal. Uh, in the, the following year, Pope John X sent his legates to mediate a peace between the Croats and the Bulgarians uh, and uh, the, the kingdom here was uh, fundamentally created. Right? It is said that Duke Tomislav was crowned even actually before the Battle of the Bosnian Highlands 925, but we don't really know whether the crowning had actually occurred. As we were saying before, just the, the papal documents uh, assert this. Um, also later sources like the aforementioned Historia Salonitana mentioned Tomislav as, as a king. Uh, also the Chronicle of the Priest of Duclea uh, that were that the Ian says that Tomislav's reign lasted 13 uh, years. This is also a 13th century um, uh, source uh, by the way mm, culpit um, say pre preserved in copy, however, from at the latest by a 17th century Latin manuscript, so a bit distant. But um, surely the capacity of the Croats to withstand the Bulgarians on the Bosnian Highlands surely shows an important degree of political compaction that even Tlitomislav had succeeded in, in gathering, right? You know, probably also because of the uh, the fear posed by the Bulgarians that political cohesion would uh, spread in those moments. Um, uh, in any case, uh, there in, in a note preceding the text of the Council Conclusions and Split in 925, um, it's written uh, by, in fact, the, the, the ecclesiastical sources, uh, in provincia croatorum et dalmatiarum finibus tamisclau rege, right, so rex. Uh, and this is in the twelfth canon of the Council Conclusions, uh, and also saying Rex et Proceres Croatorum more explicitly even. There is a letter sent by Pope John the uh, Tent to Tomislav, where the ruler is named, in fact, Tamis, uh, to to Tomislaus Tomislaus Regi Croatorum, right? And there are no inscriptions in Croatia over the time confirming the, the title. Um, there is um, successors in the 10th century signing themselves eventually as regis, but let's say whether this royal tradition was established exactly at the time or was something that happened before, it was maybe engineered from, from the outside, of course, uh, very uh, warmly accepted by the ruler in charge at the time. We, we, we are not particularly informed. On, but uh, we will see eventually Croatian history in the later centuries. Today was just a brief introduction to the Duchy of Croatia. Hopefully, we'll make soon a video about the kingdom. Uh, and for today, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.